I can always tell when a gas guy is new to diesel tuning because he's he uses the word lean, and no, nobody uses the word lean in the diesel world. I mean, unless you're unless you're talking about clean, lean is your friend in that case. Welcome to the HPA Tuned In Podcast, I'm Andre your host and in this episode we've got Nick Pregnitz from Duramax Tuner and Calibrated Power joining us. Uh, Nick is a fairly big name in the US diesel tuning market and we're going to be diving right into the topic of diesel tuning and while in general I think it's fair to say that getting solid information on just about any form of tuning has been difficult which after all is why High Performance Academy was founded. When I personally started the transition from learning to tune gasoline engines onto diesel engines, I found the information was even harder to find. Uh, it seems that a lot of the existing diesel tuners out there in the industry really want to hold pretty close to their chest all of the information they've learned and not share it with anyone. Obviously it doesn't make it any easier for those of us who want to get started. And with these late model diesel trucks and cars for that matter, uh, quite often it is actually amazing how much power is uh, able to be achieved just simply with tuning changes alone without the need for any hardware. I'm talking here as much as 25% or more. Don't generally see that with a gasoline engine. So this conversation is going to be perfect for anyone with an interest in diesel tuning, maybe transferring those skills across from gasoline tuning to diesel. We dive deep into how the diesel engine works, the differences between petrol or gasoline and diesel engines, uh, and some of the aspects that we hear a lot of people getting confused about such as uh, what the emissions devices are actually doing for our power, whether or not uh, emissions deletes are a good thing or a bad thing. Now if you are interested as well in learning more about diesel tuning, the reason we have Nick on this podcast is because we have actually partnered with Nick and he produces our practical diesel tuning course. We've also got our diesel tuning fundamentals course as well. You can find those at hpacademy.com forward slash courses. We'll drop a link into the show notes that you can follow as well uh, if you want to find more. And as an added bonus as a listener of this podcast, you can use the coupon code podcast 75 that'll get you $75 off the purchase of your very first HPA course. All right, with that out of the way, let's jump into our interview with Nick now. All right, welcome to the podcast, Nick. Thanks for joining us today. And uh, I think it's probably a good place to get started to learn a little bit about how you actually got involved in the diesel tuning industry. It's one of those, it's not too different to gasoline tuning in that it's there's no clear path to take to become a, a diesel tuner. So, so how did you fall into this role? Yeah, I started, well, first of all, thanks for having me on. Pleasure to be here. Love what you guys do. Um, I started in diesel tuning around 2006, 2007. And I had I'd come off of uh, tinkering with my LS car using EFI Live and HP tuners. And I was, yep. I was living in a, a kind of like a cold region and found that uh, driving the LS car year round was not so good. And uh, so I was looking for a truck, but wanted something that I could tinker with. I enjoyed the tuning aspect. And so uh, the Duramax support was just coming out from EFI Live. And I figured uh, I had come off of a 12 valve Cummins. So I had one of those previous to the LS car. And I thought, you know, I'd like to get back into the diesel thing. And I got the diesel truck and then started uh, getting on the forums and trying to educate myself, which so many enthusiasts do. And found that, you know, that the support from EFI Live looked really powerful, but there just was not a lot of information out there about how to use it. Um, sure. And not a lot of guys, you know, <laughs> willing to share. So, uh, hard to believe. Yeah. Uh, so just spent a lot of time kind of participating in the forums there and that was, you know, started okay. as a hobby. So, so mainly from that, that in self-taught. Yeah. Largely, you know, uh, the guess and check method. Yeah. Okay. But uh, I mean, your your skill set and your knowledge has obviously grown exponentially since that starting point. H how did you sort of transition from playing on your own truck uh, and learning and spending time on the forums to to sort of ending up with Germax Tuna, uh, a, a, a fairly large business, which we'll talk yeah. about in a moment. <laughs> yeah, the the uh, the website was available in two thousand seven, so I bought it thinking, you know, this would be really cool if. 
I could do this. And I was getting solicited on the forums pretty regularly for help with tuning. So I would be uh, reviewing uh, folks, you know, who were tuning their own trucks. So if guys would send me their files, I'd review them, make some adjustments, review their log files, and just kind of help them through the process. And so, sure. you know, I was, I was working a second job or my main job at that point. And the business it started to become obvious to me that I could sell EFI Live, sell tunes, uh, charge for tuning support, and I would be able to make more money than I was making at my other job. So I eventually transitioned out of there and then yep. started uh, started selling, you know, slinging tunes. And uh, <laughs> yeah. At, at this point, are you are you developing your tunes on, on a dyno or is this still sort of seat of the pants, road tuning and, and, and that sort of uh aspect i was lucky enough to have a shop a diesel performance shop with a dyno that was only about an hour away from where i lived which was really useful and the owner of the shop uh, mark huxdorf was really helpful in in allowing me to come up and use the shop and and learn um and in exchange for kind of teaching him and his guys and his interested customers uh, how to sure. use efi live how to how to use the scan tool um kind of you know sharing my knowledge um okay so it's kind of a give and take there in general, and this kind of goes across the entire tuning industry as far as I've seen, and is one of the reasons why we founded High Performance Academy, is this sort of secrecy that you've kind of already alluded to. Why do you, why do you think this exists? Is it a fear that people are going to take business off other tuners or is it tuners not really prepared to sort of let down their guard and maybe admit that they don't know everything or is it a combination? I, I think I think there's definitely a combination there. I think from my perspective, when I was first getting getting into this and thinking whether or not I should share, there was the thought that I had worked so hard to find this knowledge and sifted through so many, you know, dead ends and um you know, one of the first products I offered through Duramax Tuner was a tune library, which nobody else would right. dream of offering. It was unlocked files. It was all made available to the public, which I, I don't offer anymore for those interested. But I, I was the only one sharing, you know what I mean? And, sure. and I think there's a lot of guys out there who, yes, there's uh, it's a competitive motorsport. So the idea is whatever I'm sharing can be used to beat me right at the, on the sled pull mm. track or wherever and then whatever i'm sharing can be used by whoever wants to start a tuning business to come around me but i, I don't think that's a real fear you know i don't think that's uh, from what from my take on that I, I think there's a couple of aspects there and I, i've seen this happen time and time again we through my old tuning business we we typically never ever locked a tune file uh, i was solely tuning gasoline but there's some comparable aspects here with the tuning alone irrespective of the engine the only time i really locked a tune file was if i had a customer where i, I had a pretty good suspicion that they were going to go and tinker with that tune after the car left and you know there's obviously liability there of coming back if it blows up mm -hmm. so I, I would lock the file and if they ever asked for the the password i'd happily give it to them but at the time give them the, the little lecture like hey uh, you, you you play with that you're on your own don't come crying back to me when things go wrong but what what i sort of see with tuners who are downloading a, an existing file from another car and then trying to apply it to another customer's car if you don't understand the fundamentals behind why certain changes have been made, you kind of back yourself into a corner because, uh, particularly with modified vehicles, it's very unusual to find two that are literally exactly the same. So there's always subtle differences. And if you don't really understand why a tune has done something, then it's not possible for you to make those necessary adjustments. I guess it is a little different. I mean, you are selling off-the-shelf tunes for factory trucks and within reason, obviously, you know, it is what it is then so those can be copied but I, I do fundamentally think that a tuner who's just doing copy and paste tunes there's a limit to what they're going to be able to do and, and how much business they're likely to take do, do, do you think that's fair? I think that's absolutely fair I think the, the, there's only so much customer service that tuner is going to be able to offer um, you know the product confidence the ability to explain to the customer the ability to grow and expand beyond the platform that he's already copying pasting from um, yeah, you know that it, it's a limited. <laughs> there's a limited ceiling there. Mm -hmm. Definitely. All right, let, let's talk a little bit about Duramax Tuner and, and maybe catch us up to speed with with 
the the size and scale of of what you're doing and you kind of you've pigeonholed yourself as duramax tuner but obviously you're tuning a broad range of different manufacturers trucks now as well so yeah how big is duramax yeah so duramax tuner started with my enthusiasm in duramax is obviously but we tune ford um, gm we tune cummins we tune tractors we tune all sorts of stuff Uh, calibrated power is the larger you know the larger holding company so calibrated power owns duramax tuner we operate out of a forty thousand square foot facility. Um, ha- just over half the business is tuning. The other half is turbocharger building and, you know, uh, various turbocharger activities. So we, we build a line of stealth replacement turbochargers. Uh, we also build sure. transmissions and that sort of thing. There's about 25 people who work here. Okay. So it's a pretty big operation and we haven't talked about where in the US you're based. So can you just give us a, a geographic Yeah, location? we're in Northern Illinois, Woodstock, Illinois. Okay. Mm-hmm. And selling parts, turbos, and calibrations all around the US slash world? Yeah, you got it, man. We're we're a national brand. Most of our business is national mail order. Uh, we have about a, okay. a third of our business is supporting dealers, and then um, you know the rest is just end customer. All right. So let, let's get into to diesel engine technology and as a real basic sort of entry level for a, a lot of our, our listeners will probably be coming from the gasoline tuning world, spark ignition, uh, and the, the operating principles of a uh, diesel compression ignition engine are quite remarkably different. So can you give us like a high level view of, of what, where those key differences are and how the engine works? Yeah, I like to think about it, you know, if you're coming from a gas tuning world, you're you're usually thinking about combustion stability and so you're you're really trying to manage you know not having knock not having pre-ignition not having uh you know a cylinder pressure event that's going to you know catastrophically end the engine so that's that's pretty much the limitation that you're up against you know as you're thinking about you know how can i make a how can i have a really bad day as a gas tuner um (laughs) and and that's your limitation on torque as well. So how good's your fuel, right? Um, and how are you managing, you know, that, that cylinder pressure curve? Um, in a diesel tuning, you know, that cylinder pressure curve management is, is is an overlap there, but you have basically limitless fuel stability. So as much fuel as you can shove into that motor, that's how much torque you can make. So, so I mean, that's, sure. that's the beauty of the diesel engine, and that's the draw to it, for me anyway, and, and anyone who has a a heavy vehicle that loves low RPM response and and doesn't really like to have the engine sing. So if you want to have an engine run at high load and low RPM for a long time, I mean, that scenario usually makes any gasoline tuner cringe, right? Absolutely. That's a good way to break stuff. Um, on a, on a yeah. diesel truck, you can get away with that for ad infinium. And, and that's <laughs> that's the fun in diesel tuning. Which is why we see diesel engines applied to heavy hauling vehicles where that exact situation you're talking about, low RPM, high load, is how they live. Absolutely. Absolutely. That is that is their bread and butter. Um, you know, it hasn't stopped a dedicated group of motorsport enthusiasts from adopting diesel platforms and trying to spin them as fast as they can. But, uh, you know, there's of limitations course. to how fast the, f- the fuel uh, burns. And of course, the existing engine designs are optimized for low RPM, high load operation. Uh, you know, switch, changing them over to double their design RPM is, is an expensive process. And one of the aspects there, because of that design for, for low RPM performance, and I mean, it's not uncommon to see a diesel engine with an RPM ceiling of maybe 4,000. So in line with that, the internal components are uh, hugely heavy in comparison to a typical gasoline engine, correct? Absolutely, yeah. Pistons are heavy, rods and, and are heavy. And they're dealing with very, very high cylinder pressures as well, which is it goes in line with why they're, they're designed that way. Yeah, yeah, factory cylinder pressures, you know, 1,500 PSI peak on a 300 horsepower diesel. I mean, a performance diesel, we might see over 4,000 PSI peak cylinder pressure. And that, that yeah. you know, and even higher than that. So, I mean, you're talking <laughs> in the air, in the uh, you know, nitro drag race stuff, you know, that's, that's sure. very high cylinder pressure. Right, so the actual combustion process though, this is one of the key differences here with with a normal gasoline engine, we are initiating the combustion process with a spark. So uh, ignition advance, spark advance, whereabouts that spark is occurring relative to top dead centre uh, has a has a big key on a number of factors, the, the peak cylinder pressure and of course the amount of torque and hence power the engine is going to produce. 
in a compression ignition diesel engine, uh, it, as the name implies, it's compression that is igniting the, the fuel. So what what's the sort of difference or what control have we got there on the combustion process in a, a common rail diesel engine? Yeah, so if comparing those two, you know, look at them side by side, the the diesel engine, there's no fuel in the cylinder as the as you're coming up on the power stroke. So there's no risk of pre-ignition. So, yep. uh, you know, we can control cylinder pressure in a diesel engine by spread, by having multiple injection events. So think of it like a spark plug firing multiple times and slowly ramping up that flame front. Uh, you really have great control in a modern diesel engine about uh, about how you shape the cylinder pressure curve. And that's that's the advantage for... Um, the factory is using these stronger and stronger engine controllers and, you know, three, four, five, six, seven injection events per cycle, uh, extremely high uh, injection pressures. But, you know, yep. they're, they're really trying to manage the shape of that cylinder pressure curve with a diesel. So in short, we inject the fuel and depending where we inject that fuel, it's then heated by the, the heat of the compression that's occurred, very high compression ratios typically in diesel engines as well compared to gasoline, and at some point basically the fuel spontaneously combusts. Yeah. So what you're talking about there is you've got multiple injection events, so you're injecting just the right amount of fuel to, to when it combusts, you've got the the shaping of the, the pressure in the cylinder. Yeah, so picture you're, you inject a small amount, you get, you know, you. The cylinder becomes hot. You inject a, a slightly larger amount, and you start to build cylinder pressure. And then, you're with these pilot events. You're really um, changing the time between start of injection and start of ignition. And yep. you know you, what we want is the flame front to travel evenly and smoothly across the combustion chamber. We don't want to have a, a knock, you know, a large uh, a combustion event where there's a flame propagation in, in multiple areas of the combustion chamber, and they're all meeting at once in the center of the combustion chamber. And so as that that uh, fuel comes out of that injector at 32, 35,000 PSI, whatever it is, you know, it's it's starting to ignite and, and the flame front is, is coming towards the injector as that fuel is coming out. It's really quite a beautiful thing. Okay. So... It sounds like we, we can really sort of almost compare uh, ignition timing to injection timing in, in the diesel engine. And one of the aspects that you just talked about was the, the shaping of that, that pressure. And you've talked about knock. Uh, now, one of the things diesel engines, particularly the older diesel engines, were always renowned for was uh, diesel knock. And they sound rattly, you know, basically yeah. uh, not that appealing, sound like a, a dirty old tractor particularly at idle and low <laughs> RPM. So this is where the modern common rail diesel engine with the multiple uh, injection events can circumvent that to, to a good a good degree? Absolutely. Yeah, the older diesel engines, you know, even as late as 1998 with the Cummins ran a static timing setting. So you get 12 degrees of timing or 14 degrees of timing, whatever it was, and you kind of get what you get. And once that charge lights off, uh, it's it's gone you know what i mean you it yeah you, it just goes um, so in comparison if i if i could break that down so uh, to to make a certain amount of torque we're going to be injecting a certain mass of fuel into the cylinder uh the common late model common rail diesel engines were doing that gradually through the combustion cycle very very precisely controlled and by doing that gradually we're controlling the rise in the cylinder pressure uh if we take that uh older older style engine that you've just mentioned there to get that same amount of torque give or take you you're limited to injecting it all in the one shot and then when it combusts we've got this massive ramp up in the cylinder pressure is that is that's what's causing this diesel knock yeah that, that's what's causing the knock and you know you mentioned under load but most of the noise vibration harshness control most of the advantage of common rail is really at light load and idle yeah that's yeah. you know that's the that's the draw there um you know, getting yeah, definitely. That that's where you hear the older style engines are, are more more prominent with that diesel knock. Um, as you say, I mean, higher load, higher up, him it becomes less. Yeah, as soon as you get into heat, as soon as you get into boost, there's enough heat in the combustion chamber to to light off the main charge as it's coming yep. out of the injector. Um, if there's not heat in the combustion chamber, which obviously off boost, so light load, idle, that sort of thing, that's when you get that that loss of control um, and that sure. diesel knock. Okay, so let's talk about another aspect which is reasonably unique with diesel versus gasoline, which is the fact that a, a throttle body is not actually required for modulating torque. 
And this gets a little tricky because, yes, a lot of modern common rail diesel engines do have a throttle body, but uh, that's generally there for for other reasons. It's not torque management. So with a, a gasoline engine, in order to modulate the torque, the driver's adjusting the, the throttle position and then that adjusts the throttle butterfly position, which in turn controls the airflow into the engine. So how does that work in a diesel engine? What's, what's the comparison there? Yeah, in the diesel engine, you're modulating the torque output by fuel injection quantity only. So that, okay. that's the main main way of modulating torque is just controlling how much fuel is coming out of that nozzle per stroke. Now, one of the reasons we need to modulate the airflow in a gasoline engine is because there's a relatively limited range of air fuel ratios across which we can get good controlled combustion. And what I mean by that is, uh, depending on the engine, maybe we could run it as lean as 15 to 1, 16 to 1, maybe a touch leaner, but if we keep leaning it out at some point we're going to get lean misfires and, and that basically becomes the limit of our air fuel ratio. At the rich end we've got basically the same things going to happen. So. In order to modulate the torque, we need to modulate the airflow and stay within the bounds of the, the air fuel ratios we can run. But on a diesel engine, there's really no lean limit on our air fuel ratios, is there? No, there really isn't. Uh, you know, you hit the nail on the head there. It, a gasoline control is all about airflow control. And then you're relying on the ECU to control the, the stoichiometric value or your target air fuel ratio. You know, and on a diesel, you're all about fuel control and then relying on the turbocharging system to, to keep up. Um, so, yeah. you know, you, you got your low limit for low lambda limit uh, to, to keep, you know, soot under control. But uh, I have no problem running the engine at 20 plus air fuel ratio. Sure. And, and I think this is another area where those coming from a gasoline tuning background kind of, when you get into diesel tuning, it's almost a full 180. Uh, in, in gasoline engines, safety comes with rich air fuel ratios. So we're always operating, or typically operating at or richer than, than stoic. Uh, however, in a diesel engine, we're almost the opposite is the case, and we're operating on that lean side of stoic, and as we rich in the air fuel ratio, we add more fuel, we're going to create more power, which is obviously great, but the, that comes at the expense of, of additional heat. So that, is that a, a pretty pretty sort of good yeah, high-level rundown yeah, on it? Yeah, absolutely. I, I can always tell when a gas guy is new to diesel tuning because he uses the word lean, and no, nobody uses the word lean in the diesel world. I mean, unless you're unless you're talking about clean. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Lean's your friend. <laughs> lean is your friend in that case. But uh, yeah, I mean, if, if we're running rich, and I, by rich, I mean, uh, you know, lambda lower than 1.1, 1 1.15, then I'm starting to see, I'm, I'm going to start to be concerned about my exhaust gas temperatures. I'm going to start to be concerned about my drive pressure on uh, my EMAP, as you guys call it, um, on the turbocharging yes. system, uh, because all those systems really start to go inefficient as I get close to that, that uh, you know, 1.1, 1.0. Okay, uh, let's talk about uh, competition only engines where em emissions are off the table and you know the the old rolling coal as as we always hear with diesel engines and we see this with with tractor pull and drag race applications etc. You know just a, a cloud of black smoke sure. you know, the whole way down the drag strip. And in, in those applications, because what we do see in a gasoline world, and I can only assume this this transitions over to, to diesel as well, is if we look at our combustion temperature, which we're kind of in, inadvertently monitoring via exhaust gas temperature, that's sort of our guide because we can't monitor temperature in the combustion chamber directly. So we sort of see uh, you know, gasoline, we might be, let's say, lambda 0 0.80 under boost, and that would be maybe quite safe. As we lean that out to, to lambda 1, what we're going to do is start seeing the combustion temperature and the EGT climb. Uh, but if we keep leaning it out and we go go leaner than peak power and maybe we go out to 1.1 lambda, we're going to start seeing that that uh, exhaust gas temperature and combustion temperature drop again, which I think is a bit that maybe a lot of people uh, new to tuning overlook. They think the leaner we go, the, the higher the combustion temperature, and that's not, not the case. So with diesel, as you say, we're maybe 1.1, 1.15 lambda, so we're on the lean side, so we're already sort of uh, you know, cooler than that peak. Do we get the same situation, if you don't mind you know, black smoke pouring out your exhaust, if we, if we go richer than, than uh, stoic on a diesel engine, do we see that same situation? There is a school of thought that goes uh, with sled pullers that you know, in order to cool the combustion charge or cool things down, that they're going to go... 
0.9 or 0.85 lambda, you know, just absolutely rolling coal. And just, just so everybody's got kind of a picture of things, 1.0, you have visible smoke out of the tailpipe, pretty, pretty yep. solid gray out of the tailpipe. So anything below 1.0, I mean, it's, it's starting to get black. Um, so sure. 0.85 would be, would be pretty, pretty rich. Uh, we're talking like billowing smoke, right? So picture a sled pull truck. Um, yep. those trucks run the highest EGTs that I ever record on anything that I tune. So okay. there may be a point where, where it'll start to cool back off after <laughs> by going to 0.7. Um, <laughs> but you're not looking to find it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm not the guy to ask on that. I, that's, yeah. that's beyond my safety yeah. zone. Um, and honestly, I, yeah, I've seen reason. power fall off on an engine dyno going that rich. So I think whatever you gain in safety is lost in comp in the competition spirit. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. So we've covered if your ratio there and the fact, again, just to reiterate, we're basically a full 180 in terms of how we approach diesel fuel ch- delivery versus gasoline. The other one that, that's kind of also a bit of a an oddity and flies in the face of of you know, what gasoline tuners think is is boost. So with a gasoline engine, to make more power, we add more boost, but that becomes potentially dangerous. And a, a lot of it sort of, there, there is a, an overlap there. Uh, we can make more power with more boost in a diesel engine, but it's, it's all really about delivering more airflow to the engine. So we've already talked about the fact that in a diesel engine, we add more fuel, we make more power, but we create more heat. So with the, the turbocharger, we have the, the ability to then add more boost, which creates more airflow, leans out the mixture for the same mass of fuel, so we make more power safely. Is that kind of, again, like a, a good high-level view of things? Yeah, absolutely. The, mo- the more boost you can run, again, within the capability of the turbocharging system, right? But the more boost you can run, generally, the lower EGT you can run. Generally, I mean, obviously, the cleaner the truck, uh, so more yeah. air mass uh, would be associated with more boost. So the cleaner the truck would run, generally, the happier the truck is. Um, I, I am always trying to target, you know, as clean to get the truck clean. If I can get the truck to run 1.2 Lambda, I feel like that's probably a good balance between running the turbocharger as hard as I need to. So I don't want to run the tur- turbocharger needlessly hard. I don't want to clamp the of veins course. down or clamp the wastegate down to get 1.4 Lambda if I don't need it. But if I can get to 1.2 Lambda, get a clean truck and, uh, you know, keep that, keep that airflow up, you're going to keep that keep that engine cool which obviously flies right in the face of everything that any gas guy is thinking definitely right i mean hopefully at at this point in the conversation those who are fresh to diesel tuning and come come from that gas tuning world are starting to sort of take note like these are very different engines that require a very different approach to tuning and and we do see a a lot of gas tuners get into the diesel tuning world and find that they they are thoroughly lost Uh, for example my very first experience with a turbocharged diesel engine uh, I did apply the the gas tuning mentality, and I'm sorry to say, and added boost, and uh, lo and behold, it didn't make any more power because why would it? Yeah, uh, we needed to add more fuel to go with that. So slowly, yep. I, I learned, which is which is why we partnered with you to develop some courses. But uh, that's a, a topic for for another day. Uh, so when when you're tuning a, a factory diesel truck there can be some significant power gains to be had, even with no hardware modifications. And this again is quite dramatically different to the sort of potential gains we might see in a gas vehicle. Uh, Maybe in a typical turbocharged gas engine, uh, we might be able to pick up maybe 10 to 15% more power, uh, maybe sometimes very little if, if anything. So what would you say with the, the typical US domestic market trucks, the Duramax, the, the Power Stroke, Cummins, etc., you know, what what can you pick up with, without starting to actually tinker with the hardware on them? Yeah, so I, I can say, you know, we've just been through uh, certification testing, so, uh, you know, e- uh, emissions testing on on all of our large three platforms. Um, and pretty much all of them were looking at 25 to 28 percent uh, power increase. So peak power to peak power increase mm. uh, between stock and our Cal before we start to run into situations where we're uh, compromising the long term reliability of the vehicle. Okay. So, you know, yeah, that, that's there's very massive. few gasoline engines where you can do that. I mean, uh, maybe the EcoBoost. Sure. But yeah, there's not many. It's definitely not common. Not common. And, 
And how, how are you sort of validating the, the reliability? Because you know, you've got a reputation in the industry. You, you don't want to send out a, a calibration that, that's going to have uh, an engine failure occur in 10,000 miles of use, obviously. Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, we've been in this business 14 years. The last thing I need to do is release a cal to the wide market and start start seeing soldiers fall. You know what I mean? No, nobody wants to be in that position. So, uh, of course, we're driving and testing and, and validating. Um, some of the things we're looking at as we're testing, uh, we're looking at regen frequencies. Uh, of course, we're monitoring Lambda. Um, so we're looking to make sure that we're maintaining that, that air fuel ratio that we're targeting. Uh, we're looking at exhaust gas temperature, uh, you know, pre-turbo, post-turbo, whatever's avail- available on the vehicle. And we're comparing that to the baseline standard of the vehicle. And we're looking to see that the safety features still work. So most mm-hmm. of these factory trucks, you know, uh, the ECUs have, have advanced almost to the, st- <laughs> to the state of motorsports a few years ago, right? Where we, you have these back downs available to you. So if, if the exhaust gas temperature gets too hot, we can uh, gradually pull fuel back. If the turbocharger sure. speed gets beyond what we feel is safe, uh, we can start to open the veins and control turbo speed to make sure that we don't have a turbocharger failure. So, you know, we're always leaving these safeties in place, uh, possibly massaging them slightly, but, you know, we're, we're, we're not looking to compromise long-term reliability of the vehicle if we don't have to. Yeah, obviously. All right, you've, you've just dumped a couple of terms in there that I want to dive back into and, and unpack a little bit. Yeah. So uh, regen frequency, which is a, an aspect of the DPF or diesel particulate filter that's in the exhaust. So there's a lot of emission stuff that's packed into these late model diesel engines as emissions requirements have become more and more stringent. So what are, what is a regen frequency? Or could you even start yeah, by what yeah. is the regen cycle? Well, yeah, let's let's uh, start from the top here. So these late model vehicles, basically 2007 and a half and newer, are equipped with diesel particulate filters, which are filters designed to capture any diesel particulate that co- may come out of the exhaust. So these filters, in order to uh, get rid of this particulate matter that they catch, need to regenerate at a high temperature to cr- uh, convert that soot, which is... Uh, kind of a nasty particulate matter into ash, which is less harmful to the environment. When they regenerate, they use either uh, fuel in a late part of the power stroke or they inject fuel after the turbocharger into the oxidation catalyst to get the DPF up to cooking temperature. And so mm-hmm. every time this happens, you know, there's a, uh, there's a lifespan across this diesel particulate filter. And every time this thing regenerates, you know, it, it degrades that lifespan by a small tick. So we want to make sure that that we're giving the same lifespan that the factory offered. So we're looking to see how many regen cycles should a customer expect with our tune versus a factory cal. And so we're looking at uh, distance between. So a late model Duramax, for instance, uh, the one like you guys have at your shop, the L5P, we're looking at roughly 400 miles between this burn off or this regen. And so during our drive cycles, we're looking to see, are we maintaining that 400 miles? You know, and if we're not, why are we not? Is it because we have okay. too much soot and the filters catching it, right? So, so that that sort of comes back to what what is creating this. So we've already talked about the fact that to make more power, uh, we can add more fuel. But as we add more fuel, we get down around that 1.1, 1.15 lambda, you're going to start generating more particulate matter or soot in the exhaust. So basically what's happening there is with a, a dirty calibration, if you've got too much fuel in there, yes, you're going to make more power. But of course, then you're creating more soot, which is then filling up the DPF faster and the regen cycles will happen more frequently. That, yeah. That's it in a nutshell? Yeah, that's it in a nutshell. It's all about that transient operation you know in a gas vehicle you crack the throttle and you get that instant air rush in a diesel there's latency there yeah i think that that sort of really comes down to a a, a, what we see with maybe tuners out there who uh and are missing the experience don't have the understanding what's going on you because you've got that diesel particulate filter in there you're not necessarily going to see uh such at the tailpipe because that's what it's Therefore, so it, it can, you can be easily into a situation where you think you're doing a great job, you've added more fuel, you've got a rich lambda, relatively speaking, and you're making great power, but you don't realize that you're actually filling that DPF up really, really quickly. We see that quite often in the aftermarket is that uh, you know, in the course of adding power, uh, guys have twisted the operation of the ECU in a way where it can no longer accurately measure the stoichiometric value, or maybe they, or maybe they've just 
skewed the target lambda or the, or the lambda limits to a point where they're unsafe. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's that's a really common practice, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, now, in terms of other emissions devices uh, on the trucks, because every time we put up anything about emissions uh, on late model diesel trucks, we inevitably get uh, a bunch of people commenting that you've got to delete all of the emissions gear because it's unreliable. So we've got the DPF, we've got exhaust gas recirculation, which is uh, not restricted just to diesel engines, and then we've got um, often diesel exhaust fluid as well, which is injected uh, basically as a catalyst in the exhaust to to again help with emissions. So, what, what's your take on emissions tuning and emissions devices? Uh, the argument that we hear is twofold: one, that they rob power, uh, and the other one is around the long term reliability of these components and the cost to the owner of, of keeping them on the truck. Yeah, it's a you know, there's a compromise and it depends on how much you value noise, how much you value smoke, how much you value uh, clean emissions. If you don't value those things, then of course those components are going to appear to be useless to you, in which case mm -hmm. you may be prompted to delete them. Um, my experience in my business is that there are a large number of buyers, truck owners out there who, who do think that those components add value. Um, not necessarily in the performance aspect of the truck, but certainly to make the truck clean, quiet, smoke-free, um, and and you know handle the emissions. So, um, you know, <laughs> I'll answer your second question first. Do they hurt power? To a large extent, no. Um, in our testing, the factory DPF and factory DOC are more than adequate to handle the factory output of the truck. Um, certainly they're adequate up to roughly that 110, 120 X rear wheel horsepower. Sure. What we notice in our testing is that the diesel oxidation catalysts, which would be analogous to the uh, catalytic converter on a gasoline car, is the, usually the first thing after the turbocharger and that's usually the most restrictive part in this system. So okay. um, that starts to choke things off, usually close to 600 rear wheel horsepower in the late model Ford, late model uh, GM, the, the RAM is a little bit later, maybe 650 horsepower. So okay. yeah, those, those components, you know, they're not designed to make 800 horsepower. They're, they're just simply not designed for that. But if you're just looking for an extra 120, 100 horsepower, somewhere around that, we can, we've proven, you know, over the past, you know, 10 plus years that, that you can build calibrations and make those parts last. No, I mean, the other, probably the bigger element here that is becoming increasingly more prominent is emissions rules. And, and you know, the EPA, particularly in the US, are, are very active uh, in the aftermarket. And we're, we're seeing a lot of both gasoline and diesel tuning workshops being given some pretty hefty fines. So uh, it's safe to assume that it's uh, certainly not in your best interest to produce uh illegal tunes or uh, or emissions delete tunes no i mean anybody who's in that business is is got you know the, the days are numbered um if, yeah. if they're not already shut down uh, remember as a customer that if you buy tunes from somebody who's selling those files odds are they're not going to be around in a year or two if you need support uh, they're going to be very difficult to get a hold of by nature you know they're ghosts uh, they want to they want yeah. to operate that way so if you know, there's a lot of these other costs that you don't consider when you think you're doing your truck a service by deleting it. You know, am I going to be able to trade the thing in? Am I going to be able to sell it? If I have an issue with it, who's going to support it, right? Can I, will I be able to get a hold of this tuner if I need to? Um, and then you have this, this whole thing about uh, EGR deletes and, uh, you know, you're, you're messing around with a lot of stuff underneath the hood and you're bolting on aftermarket products built by shops that are... Uh, maybe not as established as they could be, right? Sure. I mean, you know what exhaust components, what kind of abuse those things take, right? I mean, we're talking drive pressures of 60 or 70 PSI, you know, temperatures of 1500, 1600 degrees. I mean, what do you, how long do you expect these parts to last and who's going to be around to help you, you know, yeah. when they're not engineered properly? Yeah, okay. 
All right, I'll come back to a couple of other elements that um, you mentioned, and one was uh, exhaust gas temperature, and you said there's some safeties in, in the uh, late model ECU, so sometimes they're directly measuring exhaust gas temperature, other times it's actually calculated to save the cost of a sensor, and you can have some safety sort of protocols there. Uh, the diesel tuning world, I, I think probably a, a lot of tuners ha have relied almost exclusively on exhaust gas temperature as a guide to whether their air fuel ratio or their fuel delivery is, is too high, too low, or what's available. So can you talk to us about the relevance of exhaust gas temperature for a tuning aid? Uh, you're right. A lot, of, a lot of guys have relied on that pre-turbocharger exhaust gas temperature in the diesel market. And I think what they've used it for is a kind of a, a proxy for a back, uh, an EMAP, so exhaust manifold uh, pressure. Sure. Obviously, the higher the exhaust manifold pressure, the high uh, because of you know the ideal gas law, um, your EGTs are going to start kind of soaring at that point. So what yeah. we see is that there's this uh, as as the load on the engine comes up, exhaust gas temperature will quickly ascend from maybe uh, five or six hundred degrees at light cruise, and this is Fahrenheit, five or six hundred Fahrenheit up to maybe ten fifty Fahrenheit pre turbocharger. And sure. then we'll have a kind of a plateau or a, a flattening of that as the engine runs through its uh, efficiency curve. So maybe between 100 horsepower or 150 horsepower, rear wheel horsepower output, it might be at 1,000 degrees. And then all the way up to maybe 400 horsepower, you might be at 1250 or 1300. So there's a, a flattening of that. And then as you get past that, that uh, you know what I would call the ef very efficient operating range of the engine, you again see the EGT start to crest, and it it, it takes a, a relatively aggressive attitude or slope north. And mm -hmm. what what a lot of tuners do is they look at how quickly that that gauge is sloping north to get a to get an idea of how happy the engine is. So by looking in the yeah. side view mirror and that exhaust gas temperature, uh, the you know the amateurs of the world can get a pretty good picture of what's going on. Okay, this this is sounding a little bit hit and miss though oh yeah and, and i mean from my own experience you know, th there's a lot of variables that i see with egt readings on uh, gas engines uh, and i'm talking here i see minor differences in the egt reading between an exposed tip and an encased tip thermocouple so that's the first one uh, we also see differences in how far the uh, thermocouple is extending into the exhaust manifold uh, basically if it's sitting right on the wall versus right in the middle of the flow there's a difference how far away it is from the ports that's another difference and then the other big one which which we see with people adding EGT to a diesel truck is obviously it's much easier to fit it post turbocharger in the downpipe because you don't have to pull your whole uh, turbocharger and exhaust manifold apart in order to get that in there uh, and, and there's again there's a difference in that so how, how much value can we put on a specific number from EGT when there are so many variables as I see it in, in the system what's you're your always, take on that you're always so picky Andre why you got to have everything I'm perfect? sorry <laughs> <laughs> no, you I'd just like to know what I'm looking at <laughs> you make a good point you know that the anytime you're looking at a factory thermocouple it, obviously you can rely on the engineering that went into putting that thermocouple where it's supposed to be. So if you're an aftermarket performance shop and you're relying on EGT for anything, you're going to want to be consistent in who you're selecting for your sensor, where you're installing those sensors, depth, uh, you know, all, all those elements that you just described. Um, I, I particularly, you know, I was always a pre-turbocharger exhaust gas temperature guy for a long time. And then mm -hmm. I installed a pre-turbo uh, on an LML I don't know, maybe 2014 or 15 or way back when they came out and really started paying attention to post turbo because the truck is factory equipped with a post turbo charger thermocouple. Okay. And a lot of, a lot of OEMs do that because th they don't see as much temperature. They can rely on the sensor, you know, the lifespan uh, bean counters like it, right? Everybody's happy. Yeah. Uh, except for the performance guys. But what I was seeing is that I would never exceed 350 degrees Fahrenheit variance between the two. So as the okay. and as the turbocharger load went higher, that delta was higher. But of course, you know, even running the turbocharger, you know, obviously that that's the energy that the turbocharger is using. So the higher yeah. more you're asking out of it, the more the delta. Um, but 
I could I could I rely think the on part that that that's easy to overlook for those who are just coming into this fresh is that the turbocharger is driven by both heat and exhaust mass flow, so there is that temperature delta as you say it, it's it's how the 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 turbocharger is taking its energy, so it's understanding that delta. So I, mean, I guess what I'm saying is. If you were using pre-turbocharger EGT numbers as a guide to what's safe, but you're applying that to the numbers you're reading post-turbocharger, you're in for a world of pain, correct? What we what we can see on the on the LML is that if if your EGTs post-turbo go above roughly 1050 Fahrenheit, you can be pretty certain that your pre-turbo EGTs are are going north quickly. I mean, you're at 14, yeah. you're at 1450, 1500. And at that point, you know, if you're starting to crest 1600 degrees pre turbocharger on a diesel, you're starting to ask what it, what would be beyond reasonable out of the turbocharger. So there's really, okay. you, you, there's not a lot of predictability in your Delta any longer. Yeah. Um, yeah. You, you're getting into, you're getting into the danger zone. Did that, answer, did that answer your question? I'm not sure. If I, th- I think so. Okay. Yeah. I, I mean, what what I just want people to realize is that Delta exists and, and just understanding what that is. So you can, yeah, I'm not saying that you can't use post turbo EGT. Obviously, it, it's a viable option. And it's definitely, as I mentioned, easier to install. It's just understanding that Delta exists and, and adapting your targets to suit. But which comes back to the, the next obvious question um, and I, I'd be interested in your take on this. So is there a, a solid line in the sand? You've sort of mentioned 1550, 1600 degrees Fahrenheit. I, I don't speak American, so I can't I can't change that into my head into real numbers metric. <laughs> um, but, but, but is there just a hard line like this is the number or does it then come down to is it a street driven truck? Uh, that's given a, a bit of a burst from a set of lights once in a while uh, or you know it, it's it's actually being used to haul 10,000 pound loads up hills you know what what's what, what do we need to know about that the relevance of EGT versus the engine reliability yeah that, that's you know we could get this question so many times from our customers is what is the what is the abort temperature when should I let off yeah. and of course the answer depends on what you're doing with the truck. Uh, if you're if you're towing with it, you know if you're using it loaded, uh, you know towing up a grade, so you know at a minute at a time, um, you're trying to trying to protect the pistons and you're trying to protect the the turbine. So you're relying on the piston cooling to pull heat out of the piston, and you know your oil temperature is obviously coming up as you're going up that hill and becoming less of you know less <laughs> uh, efficient at pulling heat out of that piston. Um, so we want to keep a lower temperature in the exhaust. Uh, so usually 1350 is the factory abort temperature on the early trucks. Now, later okay. trucks, we've seen as high as, uh, I've seen 1405, I've seen 1530. The L5P, I believe is 15, right over 15, um, 1500, depending on RPM. So I think as the factory gets a uh, better sensors and a better ability to uh, build predictive models, and it has yeah. these back downs in, you know, they're taking advantage of running for for short periods, at least at higher temperatures. It's just like putting a lighter under your thumb, right? It's cool. You can do it, but don't do it for very long or you're going to burn yourself. Um, the same yeah. thing with EGTs, you know. Yeah. So it's, it's not just the the combustion temperature that that's the critical cr- criticality. It's the combustion temperature multiplied by time. So what you can get away with for a short burst, essentially is what you're saying, is, is quite different to a, a minute or two climbing up a hill with a heavy Yeah, load. Yeah, we tell guys, you know, if you're going to drag race your truck, don't even bother looking at the temp gauge. It really doesn't matter. Uh, but if you're if you're towing, you know, that that's when you absolutely want to know what the truck is doing temp-wise. Yeah. So again, uh, just to kind of come circle back to, to something you mentioned there with these back downs. So this, I, I'm guessing with the older trucks, you kind of were compromised if they didn't have those back downs on exhaust gas temperature. If uh, you had a customer who was towing heavy loads, you really had to tune for the worst case scenario of, of extended high load operation and they would give away the potential power and, and talk advantage that they'd have for short bursts. But now with these modern trucks, you really can have the best of both worlds. You can have an aggressive tune, but with these back downs for the extended load periods. That's exactly what I'm saying. Yeah, we're, we're okay. taking advantage of that, that time 
element of the EGT and we're using that extra power while we can and then backing down. Yeah. Okay. Most Perfect. times, most times customers need power. They don't need it for two minutes at a time. You know, it's just to get out in a traffic sure. or to get around somebody. All right. So we've talked about EGT. And we've we've touched on Lambda, and you've given us sort of some some information on that. So again, I, I don't see too many diesel tuners, or certainly the if your ratio Lambda input has not maybe been the most predominant <laughs> measure used by diesel tuners. Uh, do you think that's a mistake? Uh, uh, how how are you kind of weighing up your the importance you place on Lambda versus the importance you place on EGT, or do they both have to go into the equation? I think Lambda is probably more important than EGT in my tuning anyway. I'm I'm looking much less at exhaust gas temperature uh, over the past four or five years than I have been at Lambda. Sure. Um, I want to. What I want to see is that my lambda limit that I have in the truck, so in the lamb in the low lambda uh, table, so the mixture limit table, whatever it's you know whatever it's called in that operating system, I want to see that the truck's not going below that. So I want to look yeah. and see you know is my sensor showing a lambda of 1.05 when I have a low limit of 115? Right? That tells me I have something wrong. Something's not being calculated correctly. Uh, the truck is not able to. You know, not figuring things out, and as a result, I should expect probably higher soot loads than I'm anticipating. I, I think one of the things as well to to keep in mind there for those who have been re- relying on EGT is that that it's effective, but it is actually quite a slow sensor. There's a latency in terms of its response time, uh, whereas the the lambda is a much faster acting, and obviously the EGT is is driven by by lambda among among other things. So. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's sensible to to monitor lambda, and I mean these days, let's be honest, it, it's not it's not difficult, and it's certainly not expensive to add a, a wideband if your ratio meter. No, I don't think it's any more difficult to add that than it is an EGT probe, and you know you make a great point. It depends on which probe you got, you're, you're going to have some latency there. Mm. All right, um, mo- moving on. Th- there's also I see a lot of people talking about uh, failure points on on diesel engines, and, and there have been some reliability issues uh, around certain elements, particularly on the US domestic market trucks, which I think maybe uh, have put a few people off. Um, fuel pump failures, in particular, uh, one of the ones we, we talked just pre-interview here about uh, the CP4 high pressure pump. Uh, and you know, there's been failures with the earlier CP3 as well. So can you talk to us about what happens there and, and why these failures are occurring? Because I mean, I hear people talking about having these pump failures and basically the entire fuel system then needs to be replaced, which admittedly is not a cheap exercise. No, I would, I would call that a design issue or an engineering flaw. Okay. I mean, I, the LML truck, so the 2011 to 2016 Duramax is probably by category, you know, the biggest target for this discussion. Uh, they were equipped with a CP4 pump, which was a change from the earlier model year, the CP3. It doesn't sound like much of a difference, just three to four, but <laughs> that, <laughs> that's that, one number. Just one number. That's all it took. Um, you know, the pump is certainly capable of making the pressure. It's certainly capable uh, of, of doing its job. The issue is just reliability. And because sure. of the, the inconsistency in fuel quality, um, you know, what I think happened is the bean counters played it a little too close. And they didn't anticipate that you know the the fuel quality would be as uh, inconsistent as it was, and as a result, you know statistically speaking, we're seeing a lot of CP4 failures uh, based on how many vehicles were sold. And okay. furthermore, when the CP3 failed, it would it would eject its guts back to the fuel tank, which sounds bad if you're you know curious about things, but it's much better than sending its guts streaming through a bunch of extremely high tolerance precise uh, instruments like the like the fuel injectors fuel injectors and, yeah, and sensors okay. so you know if cp3 fails you replace the cp3 the fuel pump will pick up the debris and it'll run it through the filter and you know no harm no foul 10 years down the road someone will find it in the bottom of the tank but a cp4 fails and the whole system's gone and that is a nightmare okay now one of the things as uh, aftermarket tuners we're trying to get more fuel and more air into the engines. We've got an injector that can only pass a given amount of fuel uh, in a certain amount of time. So one of the keys a- as you push these these engines harder is ramping up the fuel pressure from, from the stock pressure targets uh, so that for a given uh, pulse width to the injector, we're actually getting more fuel mass being delivered to the cylinder. So does driving the, the CP4 or any of these pumps harder than, than the factory uh, pressure targets, does, does that accelerate the, the failure point? 
I can only imagine that it does. I have not done the pump test to to verify that. Um, I have been privy to a few pump tests that show that with good quality fuel that we can run higher pressures than stock. Um, and some yeah. of our cals, we do run higher pressures than stock uh, just to achieve those power targets. And, you know, I think, you know, while we're talking about injectors, I think it's interesting from a gas market side of things. Um, you know, gas guys, you up your injector size and usually it's it's not too hard to get the vehicle to still run well and clean and mm. idle nicely. Um, I, those low speed, uh, you know, the, the way the vehicle performs at low speed is, is largely dictated by, um, by the injector. And so the ability of the injector to atomize fuel um, and the ability of the injector to deliver fuel uh, consistently across the whole spectrum of operation on a diesel is a, is a real feat of engineering. Um, and, and so, you know, going to larger, going to higher fuel pressure allows that great control at low load, but still allows the injector to act like a much larger injector at high load. So having a wide yeah. spectrum of fuel pressure is a really useful tool. Now, obviously, we'll just sort of dive down this rabbit hole a bit further. Obviously, at some point, you you just simply get to the limit if you can't physically increase the fuel pressure anymore. So that injector is done. And if you want to make more power, your option is to go to a larger injector. Mm -hmm. So as you've mentioned, that, that's an easy easy task in the gas world. There's, there's dozens of manufacturers making aftermarket injectors and the quality and accuracy of those injectors has come along leaps and bounds in the last decade at least. So uh, you, you're basically insinuating there, doing that in a, in a diesel engine uh, will get you the power, but you're going to sacrifice that bottom end drivability, idle yeah. quality, et cetera. Yeah, think about it in a gas car. You know, let's say you have a poor spray pattern out of a large injector. Well, it's still spraying fuel on the intake stroke, and you have a lot of swirl and action in the in the uh, cylinder as that piston comes down and comes up on compression. So pretty much you can rely on the air charge and fuel charge to be mixed by the time you get mm. to spark, right? On a diesel, you're relying on that, on that flame to start a very small amount of time after the start of uh, injection. And if those flame, if those fuel particles are not atomized correctly and not spaced correctly, uh, then they don't burn correctly. And you get, uh, you can get fuel kind of hiding by the rings or hiding on the outside of the cylinder. And you might get what's called a, uh, an idle haze or a cruise haze. And mm -hmm. it's not a, it's, it's not a gray haze like you'd see under load from just a low, uh, excessively rich Lambda, it's just a poor efficiency in burn. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So that's the, that's, that's the compromise, unfortunately. All right. So if you're looking at that sort of, you're just at the limit of the, the stock injector, you don't really want to give away that, that bottom end, which we've just talked about. Uh, are there options for higher pressure aftermarket fuel pumps so you could go significantly higher than what you safely could with a factory pump or is, is that not that sort of not really a, a viable option? Most of the factory fuel pumps when upgraded, so a, a really common mod on the fuel pumps, the CP4 and the CP3 is to go to like a 10 millimeter or 12 millimeter, even a 14 millimeter stroke on the pump, which, okay. which can double or triple its output. So sure. on those pumps, um, what we find is we can go from maybe 29,000 uh, PSI of peak pressure up to 34, 35,000. And that might get us another 50 horsepower or more, um, which is which is usually, you know, just about what we're looking for. So, sure. so yeah, there, there are um, options for going with higher pressure. Um, of, of course, you know, there's, a, <laughs> there's the reliability question mark, like you mentioned on the CP4, you know, do you want to be mm. running that CP4 at that high pressure? But the reality is you're doing it so infrequently. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and again, I guess what people may may not understand is we've got a 3D table essentially for our target fuel pressure. So as, as you mentioned, you really, you only need to ramp up that pressure at the point you need it, which is the, right. the high, Maybe from high, 500, high load. Right, maybe from 560 horsepower to 650 horsepower. So it's very, yeah. you know, very infrequently are you using that kind of high pressure, usually you're within the factory ceiling. Of course. Uh, I mean, I guess another good question with those CP4 pumps, if someone has got a truck with a CP4 pump fitted or they're looking at, at purchasing a secondhand vehicle with that pump and it's a known potential failure point and they want to avoid uh, the, the expensive repair work, uh, is there an aftermarket option now to, to replace that pump or what what would you suggest? Yeah, there's um, there's some options out there. So the guys with CP4s, they can 
change to a CP3. I don't recommend that out of hand. I mean, it's something you can do, but I wouldn't say, oh, you bought a truck with a CP4, you must change to a CP3. Uh, There's a part called a fuel system saver, which is a basically a large, uh, more robust screening mechanism for that debris. So when that pump or if that pump fails, that uh, fuel system saver Mm -hmm. should catch that debris and then cause a fuel blockage in the system and shut the truck off. Okay. And what we've seen is that that usually saves the rest of the fuel system. So yes, the CP4 fails, but it doesn't become catastrophic. Yeah, okay. Which is a cheap mod and a really smart thing to do. Yeah, sounds sounds like a no-brainer really mm-hmm. to me. All right, so let, let's talk a little bit about turbo technology because this is a, another area that I know you, you're you're pretty deep into with these stealth turbos, which you mentioned at the start. Uh, and, and the other thing that's probably worth talking a little bit about is the the VNT. Uh, technology, variable geometry technology that, that is is pretty much the standard in, in diesel engines. I mean, it's not restricted solely to diesel engines, but we certainly don't see it that often on a, on a gas engine. So can you, can you tell us what that technology does, what the advantages are and why it's there? Yeah, mostly, I think a lot of the reason on the VN, let me start at the beginning. So the VNT technology came in when the EGR came in. And so in order to get exhaust gas to flow into the intake track, you needed to have a delta in pressure from the exhaust track to the intake track. And so the easiest way to do that is to kind of close up the exhaust a little bit. Well, when you do that with a variable nozzle uh, turbocharger, you also can improve low end response. So mm-hmm. it's, it's a double bonus. <laughs> um, any, anytime you can get improved low end response on a diesel, that's gonna help sell trucks, that's gonna make customers happy, that's gonna just improve general performance of the vehicle. So most of these trucks from 2004, 2007 on have variable uh, geometry turbochargers. Okay. Really nice feature for anybody operating low RPM. Basically got a, a turbocharger, which for all intents and purposes is the best of both worlds. We've got a, we can close that nozzle up and, and basically pr- provide high drive pressure at low RPM to get the, the boost response. But then if we had that sort of turbo through the rev range, uh, as the boost in RPM increases, our drive pressure, our exhaust back pressure is going to be through the roof and that's going to really strangle performance. So we can open those veins up and basically it acts like a larger exhaust housing, correct? Exactly, exactly. And I, I would only correct you in that one spot where you say best of both worlds. I'd say it's it's medium of both worlds. Um, yeah, okay. You know, okay. You're, yeah, yeah, fair enough. There, there, there's never really a It's a, never a perfect best, solution. Right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, you're never going to see a one point, a, more, a one-to-one drive pressure ratio to boost with a variable geometry turbocharger. Um, best you're going to see is maybe 1.4, 1.5. Um, and, okay. and at low RPM, you might even see, you know, five or six to one. And again, for those who maybe are new to the technology involved, so this is in place of a exhaust wastegate, which we would typically use for boost control on a gas engine, correct? Yeah, yeah. So those earlier trucks would use wastegates. Some were electronically controlled. Some were just diaphragm style. Okay, so you've got into the world of creating these stealth turbos and you're engineering these to basically provide <laughs> the best of both worlds. <laughs> um, a significant increase in, in performance but uh, you, you've, you've got to really walk a fine line here obviously we could chuck a massive turbocharger on just about any engine and probably uh if we can keep up with the fuel demands it's going to make good power at higher rpm but we're going to probably give away a, a bunch of low rpm boost response which maybe isn't such an issue on a gas engine which revs to seven or eight thousand but you know if you give away a thousand rpm of boost response on a on a diesel truck engine that only revs to four, well, that that's that's a different deal. So how, how do you go about walking that tightrope? That, that's, yeah, I shot myself in the foot there with that compromise, didn't I? Um, <laughs> didn't you, Jason? <laughs> Always um, comes back to bite, yeah. It does, it does. Uh, yeah, in a gas vehicle, you know, you have the option to either, either you have a manual transmission or you have an automatic transmission, you may be able to shift the rev range to target you know, the operation of that turbocharger, or if you change the camshaft profile, you're going to change the, uh, you know, t- target operating range of the engine. On a diesel, sometimes we have control over the transmission shift points. Sometimes we don't. Uh, if we don't have control over the uh, trans control module, we are limited to the operating range that the truck is given from the factory. You know, and in that case, we really have to be cognizant of that low boost response because it may be, the truck may feel very drivable unloaded, but once you put a trailer mm-hmm. behind it and you start asking the truck to pull from 12 or 1300 RPM, the driver's going to find out pretty quick 
you know, if the turbocharger was designed to operate at that RPM or if the target range has been shifted up five, six, 700 RPM. So, yeah. so we really have to, you know, we target a, a very subtle horsepower gain from factory. So factory turbocharger might be at its outer limits at 530 horsepower on an early model Duramax. Our 64 millimeter turbocharger is at its outer limits at 650 horsepower. So yeah. it's only a hundred horsepower more, but it's that much more efficient at that 450, 500 horsepower range where you might see you know, 1600 degree, you might be in the danger zone on the exhaust gas temperature probe uh, on the stock turbocharger at 500 horsepower. With our turbocharger, the truck's happy. It's, you know, it's, and that's because you can increase the airflow and lean out that mixture and you're getting the same power, but with, with a leaner airfuel ratio, cooler combustion charge temperature. All of it, man. I should hire you. <laughs> yeah, that, that is our, um, that's I'm, I'm our sales it. mantra. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so I mean, let, let's bring that back to, to a vehicle that's uh, near and dear to my heart. So our, our L5P Silverado, which is already running one of your tunes. So let's just talk about the, because I'm pretty sure you've released not that long ago a Stealth Turbo for that, that vehicle, correct? Yeah, we do have a Stealth for the L5P. All right. So... For, just to put some real solid numbers around this, so let's talk about on your dyno uh, what a stock L5P makes basically straight off the showroom floor versus uh, calibration only, no hardware changes, and then versus what you can expect with the, the Stealth Turbo and basically, I mean, any other upgrades that you might want to send over to us. I mean, what, sure. what do you offer? <laughs> right, right. I knew that was coming. Um, so uh, L5P off the showroom floor, you're looking at low 400s, I think probably 405, 407 to the tire, depending on the dyno. Um, yep. Tune only, you're in the low to mid 500s, so maybe five thir mm -hmm. between 530 and 550 wheel horsepower. Uh, with the Stealth Turbo on the truck, you can get just over 600 rear wheel horsepower. Uh, at that point, the truck becomes limited by the catalytic converter. So okay. what we start to see is the pressure behind or in front between the cat and the um, turbocharger starts to climb 10, 15, 20 PSI. So it's climbing very aggressively sure. at that point. We're losing our drive pressure, you know, how effectively our drive pressure can act on the turbine. Now that same turbocharger in a competitive uh, situation. So on a, a deleted truck, which might be used in a sled pole or whatever, uh, we've dynoed those uh, past 800 horsepower. Wow. Okay. So that catalytic converter at that point really is becoming a, a huge bottleneck. Yeah. So anybody listening to this podcast that wants to do a performance catalytic converter for the L5P, um, you know, please reach out to me. <laughs> oh, so that, that doesn't exist. There's does not exist. The market right no, now. does not exist yet. Yeah. Okay. That seems like, um, and I'm assuming we could probably copy and paste that same comment across all of the, the current generations. Same, same for the Ford Power Stroke. Um, same for, uh, not quite as soon on the Cummins. So the Cummins, our stealth um, stock, the truck will do 340. With our tune, it'll do about 490. With the stealth 64 on the truck, it'll do about 630, 640 before it becomes uh, converter limited. And that plays back into the earlier conversation about these people who, who are arguing for the delete site. So, Yes, obviously there is a point where the standards emissions equipment is going to become that bottleneck. So it all comes down to you know, how far are you, you wanting to push? And I imagine probably 70, 80% of people out there would be pretty happy with the 100 plus horsepower gain from, from a calibration alone. Yeah. Uh, so you, you know, those people, really the emissions devices aren't really hurting you in, in, a, in a measurable way. But the further you go, I mean, it'd be no different than taking a stock gas car and trying to triple the, the, the power output with the stock exhaust. Clearly, it's, it's just not going to be. It's not gonna exactly. Be Your cat temps are going to go through the roof at some point on, on any on any uh, factory, you know, mid pipe setup on a gas car. So, in, in terms of those uh, stealth turbos as well, sort of, how much are you giving away in terms of uh, boost threshold, boost response compared to the stock? So, we're, our goal is, uh, you know, we're usually trying to get as close to the factory response as possible. And there's some of the turbochargers which you, you really could not tell. I mean, you you just can't tell. Um, some of the turbochargers, it might be three or four hundred RPM. Uh, for a lot of the platforms, we have a 64 and a 67 or, you know, basically two options for the customers. Sure. Um, those guys who are willing to uh, run a little bit higher, higher shift schedule, trans control module, who maybe don't tow, uh, you know, gooseneck size loads. So very, you know, 10, 15, 20,000 pounds behind the truck. 
Um, if, if you're just occasionally towing a boat or a car trailer or whatever, and you know, you're never going to really lug the truck into infinity. Um, you know, the six, the 67, you know, it's probably a better fit and that might give up three or 400 RPM, a boost response. So instead okay. of, instead of coming to life at 1200 RPM, I come to life at 1750, somewhere around there. Yeah. It seems like a, a pretty reasonable trade-off. Uh, again, in the, I liken this to the gas world for a performance turbo upgrade. I mean, obviously, just just like you, we're trying to to minimise the the loss of boost response, but you know, it wouldn't be uncommon with a, a larger turbo to give away eight hundred to a thousand RPM of, of response. I guess it all depends as well on on the the width of that uh, useful rev range, of course, which is yeah. typically narrower on the on the diesel engine. Yeah, I mean, we're always ta- you know just like the gas world, we're always trying to talk our customers into a reasonable horsepower ceiling. You know, what's a reasonable target? Because we want the turbo to be basically at its limit, at your limit. <laughs> we don't want you to buy yeah, a turbo that's yeah. oversized for the application because nobody's going to be happy. Yeah, I think that the internet, unfortunately, is responsible for a lot of people having uh, misguided targets or aims for what they actually want to achieve. And, and there's nothing worse than than someone trying to piece together you know, a, an 800 horsepower combination where you know full well that something with 600 horsepower would be would blow their mind and give them a much more usable engine all round, particularly for something that's street driven. Competition's obviously a slightly different scenario. Yeah, yeah, competition's a different scenario, but there's yeah, it's it, exactly like you said. It's it's that's a daily that's a daily discussion on our sales phone. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Nick, I think we'll we'll move towards uh, closing this thing off. Uh, and I, I think that the the next question I want to ask is is what what do you see in the future for calibrated power, Duramax tuner yourself? Where, where's the journey sort of headed for you guys? I think you know anybody in the automotive performance market be blind to the uh, the upcoming advent of electrification, uh, sure. whether it be hybrid powertrains or full full plug-in electrics. Uh, I think I think the hybridization of the uh, diesel platform is maybe likely to come first before you know before uh, full electrification. But I'm trying to uh, you know tinker with hobby. You know the way I learn is through hobbies and projects. Just like, mm-hmm. just like a lot of, you know, guys listening here. And uh, I, I think, you know, I, I don't know what this business looks like in 10 years. I know I have a pretty good operating model probably up to the next 10 years. Uh, but the way that the way that the uh, OEMs are shifting over from internal combustion to, to electric motors, um, I know if I want to be, you know, playing and having fun and being at the head of the curve that I'm going to have to get smart about batteries and, and, and motor controllers and, you know, thermal limits and all, you know, start to learn about that stuff and make this business a, a, a lifetime. Yeah, I, I think that's um, smart for anyone in the industry. As you say, if you're, unless you've been hiding under a rock, it's pretty clear to see the, the direction the world is going to change to. And anyway, we're, we're looking at exactly those same uh, options for High Performance Academy to re- remain relevant. Uh, it, it's fair to assume that um, unless the EPA do something crazy, we're, we're probably going to be playing with uh, diesel and gas engines, internal combustion engines for the foreseeable future. But we're going to see that uh, that wave of, of EVs come through and, and it's only get, get, going to get bigger. Uh, next question, if if you could have your time again, essentially, with everything that you've learned, the journey that you've taken, if you could give any advice to to a younger version of yourself uh, who wants to get into that industry, maybe get into diesel tuning, maybe even build up a, a, a tuning workshop, what what would you sort of say to, to fast track that and maybe avoid some of the pitfalls you've potentially seen yourself? Well, I'd be, uh, <laughs> I'd be remiss if I didn't recommend that you avoid deleting trucks. Um, (laughs) It's going to cost me money. It's cost hundreds of people money. Uh, The EPA does not mess around. Do not delete trucks if you plan on being in business for a long time. It's just not worth it. Um, You know, (laughs) that's my end on my preach on that one. Um, Couldn't agree more. Other than that, I would would say, um, you know, make those connections. Don't be afraid to fail. Uh, try and find other, you know, the, the most I've learned in this, in this, uh, business has been working with other tuners on collaborations. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, never has it really paid for me to be at odds or butt heads with other tuners. Um, you know, you, you think if you think, you know, everything that you're doing, you, you're just not in a good position to learn and you're not going to make yourself or your business any better. So, you know, being humble about that and being willing to learn, I think goes a long way. 
I, I yeah, 100% agree. I, I think I've said this before on the podcast, you know, we never stop learning. And, and as soon as you sort of take the attitude that you're better than the next uh, guy or girl and you know everything there is and you don't need to learn anything more, well, you might as well shut the doors because uh, that's that's just a recipe for disaster. So, uh, and, and it is what I love about the industry because there's never a dull day. The, there's always new technology coming through. You're always tinkering and uh, and finding new directions. So I think that's um, that that's really powerful. Absolutely. All right, Nick. If yeah. if, uh, if our listeners want to find out more about you, uh, maybe purchase a calibration or a stealth turbo. Uh, what what are their options? Where where are you hanging out on the uh, on the social media, etc.? Uh, we, have, we have a pretty good library of YouTube videos. So Duramax Tuner YouTube. I would definitely check out that channel if you get time. We're on Facebook. We're on Instagram as Duramax Tuner. Um, DuramaxTuner.com is the website. Of course, all of our products are on there. And if you want to call, it's 815-568-7920. We've got a full staff of sales guys and customer service. Um, we we are one of the few businesses in the industry that grade ourselves on customer service. And, uh, you know, uh, it's some, something we really take pride in. So uh, put you up to the challenge there. Give us a call if you think we can help you out. Perfect. And as I mentioned in the introduction to this podcast, we, we did partner with Nick to produce uh, our practical diesel tuning course. We've also got our diesel tuning fundamentals course. So for those who maybe this has piqued their interest and in, uh, maybe you want to dive into learning how to tune your own diesel vehicle, uh, I highly recommend you check those out. You can find them at hbacademy.com forward slash courses, but we'll also chuck a, a link in the description to this podcast that you can follow as well. All right, Nick, thanks heaps for your time today. It's been a really interesting discussion and uh, yeah, we wish you all the best for the future. Thanks, Andre. I appreciate it. Great talking to you. All right, that concludes our interview. And before we sign off, I just wanted to mention for anyone who's been perhaps hiding under a rock and hasn't heard of High Performance Academy before, we are an online training school and we specialize in teaching a range of performance automotive topics, everything from engine tuning and engine building through to wiring, car suspension and wheel alignment, uh, data analysis and race driver education. Now remember, you've got that coupon code. You can use podcast75 at the checkout to get 75 dollars off the purchase of your first course you'll find our full course list at hpacademy.com forward slash courses important to mention that when you purchase a course from us that course is yours for life as well it never expires you can rewatch the course as many times as you like whenever you like the purchase of a course will also give you three months of access to our gold membership that gives you access to our private members only forum which is the perfect place to get answers to your specific questions you'll also get access to our regular weekly members webinars which is where we touch on a particular topic in the performance automotive realm we dive into that topic for about an hour if you can watch live you can ask questions and get answers in real time if the time zones don't work for you that's fine too you're going to get access as a gold member to our previous webinar archive we've got close to 300 hours of existing content in that archive it is an absolute gold mine so remember that coupon code podcast 75 check out our course list at hpacademy.com forward slash courses